Yeah, listen, Warren, I mean, I must be honest, I think if it wasn't for Mary Lally, I would have stopped training by now because I don't have a, I'm not a big marketer, you know, I don't go out there looking to market myself. I'm a bit old fashioned that way and I'm busy with so many things that I really don't have the time to do those sort of things. What I do pride myself on is that I have a lot of experience in the game. I know horses backwards. I know how to look after them. Um, you know, they always, I don't send horses to the start going down short or maybe scratchy. I'm a bit of an old woman and I am a little bit conservative in that respect. But it's just the way I was taught as a youngster to do things and that's Welcome to another edition of In the Box Seat with myself Warren Inferno, my bushy Fred Hen, my, my bushy Fred Hen. It's about right. Oh, nice, my bushy head friend Andrew Harrison, who I can't say that. I just said it bloody. It's not the, the hard cropper yesterday. Jeez, you could go a little bit. If you ask him to go a bit closer, he oh. could get rid of some of that fluff. He's uh, leopard crawling to uh, retirement, but we're going to just keep moving the goalposts a little bit for him, so we don't uh, lose him from this podcast. Our guest today is uh, Tony Riverland and uh, we welcome him. Tony, are you well? I'm very well, thank you for having me. Before we talk to Tony and before we go any further, you better, the answer I'm looking for is yes, a case of beers better be in the boot of your car because you had the audacity to come onto this show and say that wherever my filly park and flower runs, amble in. No, well, you took me out in the middle of the race. That, we didn't ask about oh, that. The yeah, result, yeah, you look yeah. at the results, was Park and Fly in front of Amble Inn. I finished third. Just check the, check the staff report. <laughs> doesn't pay his debts, you see. doesn't pay his bills and his debts. But we had to talk about Andrew Harrison. No, not to talk about Andrew Harrison. We had to talk with Andrew Harrison. And uh, Tony Rivlin's our guest. And uh, Tony, again, the stock standard question I ask absolutely everybody. And... and the responses are always different and always interesting. How did it come about that you heard about horses, horse racing, racing? When did it all start for you? Were you born into the racing family? How did you hear yeah, and get, get busy in horse racing? Well, Warren, you know, um, my father was Mauritian born and immigrated to South Africa when he was 20. His father and his uncle had a stable in Mauritius. And I don't have to tell you that the Mauritius Turf Club is the oldest turf club in the Southern Hemisphere. And the Mauritians are racing mad and so from nine years of age I used to accompany my dad to Clearwood Racecourse every Saturday morning or most Saturday mornings and watch the horses work. Um, the late um, Charlotte Bestel, which is Corinne Bestel's father, sure. um, late father obviously, um, was my dad's first cousin. So I used to go, Corinne, I don't know if she, was, she might have just been born then, um, <coughs> I used to go and feed Madame Gold, Chocolate Crisp, Far East, Sabre, Bon Petit, Gazania. Arlene Bastel had such a great string of horses. She had a little string of horses. She used to race and train for herself, her mother, and obviously George Rolls was one of her main patrons. So it started there, and Brian Passmore, the late Brian Passmore, was a very good friend of my dad as well. So I used to mosey off across to the Passmore stable. And once you get involved in racing from that age, um, and then, you know, I started playing golf at 12 and Bobby Vervey and Cyril Bradshaw and Herman Jr. We all playing, started playing golf at Windsor Park and they were all racing mad. And, you know, I've been involved in racing literally since the days I was born. I wasn't, you know, nine years of age, a long time. I'm 62. What was the, <laughs> which year did you take out your trainer's license, Tony? <clears throat> uh, January 1985. I started okay. in Summerfeld actually in December 1984. Mike Miller had started a year before and I used six box of his, six stables of his while I was busy establishing my yard at the loading bank. Now before, um, Tony, you, you worked for, for the Passmores. Yeah. yeah, I actually didn't start with the Passmores. What happened, when I matriculated, I went to university to do a BCom, and my dad's, uh, our doctor was a very good family friend, and he was very friendly with Neville Pierce, and we were friendly with Roby Weir-Smith, and Robin Scott Lodden had horses with Neville Pierce, and Brian Passmore wasn't working for his dad at that stage. He had a business, a, a fresh fruit and vegetable business, a big business, and, um, so uh, my dad had two horses with Neville Pierce. They were Marsh Rose and Distant Echoes. Distant Echoes, Pocket Power, Grade One winner, Natal Champion Philly, um, the Grand Dam of Pocket Power and River Jeté. So we raced that together. And I bred Harry's Echoes, you know, which was Champion Sprinter. And um, 
So he had those two horses with Neville Pierce, and it was very difficult to get into to a yard in those days. It was really reserved for ex-jockeys um, that could become an assistant trainer. It was even a schlep to get me registered as a stable employee, you won't believe it. Um, but, you know, my family was pretty well connected at that stage. I don't know, Jock's brother had some strange ideas. And, um, and of course, uh, I got my registration, so I used to go there in the early mornings to Neville Pierce help him out very knowledgeable horseman very good horseman very underrated trainer and horseman but um in those days as old trainers they used to battle a lot you know and things weren't easy um for them and um so neville pierce taught me a lot while i was at university in the mornings i used to go to stable early go to varsity miss a few pairs you know <laughs> used to bob and weave that way tony let's talk about your family your immediate family let's leave uh horses for a moment tell us who you're married to how many kids and, and just tell us about your immediate family yeah well I'm married to Sharon um, and I've been with Sharon I must have taken Sharon out about for about seven years before I married her but I think we've been married 21 years we have a daughter 20, 20 years we have a daughter Danielle who's nearly 18 um, but I obviously was married previously and I have a son Ross of uh, 30 nearly 37 he's an accountant and Kim, my daughter from my first marriage, Leslie, she's 34, she's an occupational therapist. Okay. Ross is not really interested in horses at all. Um, he's a fitness fanatic, Lucky that's boy. what he enjoys. <laughs> yeah. and, but Kim loves the horses and of course Danielle Rice worked for me, she's ridden in a few amateur races. She's, um, all my kids are very clever, they take after me and not their mothers. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that's, that's my family. That now, I that you know, <laughs> let's talk about Danielle because that bug's already bitten. There's, 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 uh, I won't say you're in trouble because, you know, yes, you do advise your kids to maybe, which we should, but I think we, we advise our kids not to get involved because it's such, so difficult and so hard, not because it's not a pleasant industry, but yeah. she's, the bug's bitten there. She's uh, race over for her. She's already... Uh, yeah, you know, Danielle's a highly intelligent girl. She's doing homeschooling at the moment. She does the Valentia Oxford Cambridge system online and she wants to go and study in England. But she follows racing throughout the world. She knows the form. I've tried to start teaching her a little bit, little bit about merit rating and she follows the pedigrees and um, she offers, she's a bit like me, a lot of advice to offer. You know, <laughs> how the jockeys rode, what I'm doing with the horses, where I'm running them. You know? <laughs> And um, she's definitely a chip of the old block, got a, quite a short fuse on her. <laughs> Oi, no. Doesn't have a lot of patience. Um, oh, so true. we were laughing last night. Um, she's definitely my daughter, there's no <laughs> doubt about that. Yeah, but she loves it. And, um, you know, she wants to pursue a career with horses. Um, she's a good rider herself, Danielle. And um, we never thought she, she would actually turn out to be a, a, a really decent rider. She was quite a nervous rider when she started at a young age. And even Alison writes, said to me one day and Ellison's obviously a very good rider and competent horsewoman she saw Danielle riding and said Tony and I said I'm shaking every day I watched her. and Ellison always says to me she's she's quite shell-shocked to have the metamorphosis with Danielle how she suddenly got her confidence and will ride almost anything and she's physically very strong Danielle um, you know she's not a weak weak 18 year old she has plenty of strength in her so she can hold almost anything and She's just got gone from strength to strength. It might be a lunatic comment, and, and you know, it's just it's just something that's come to me right now. You know, you, you think you think of Rachel, how Rachel started. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know about Danielle's weight and what. Her, or you said she wants to go and see and study, but I mean, has yeah. she ever even? Does she mention it that could she or might she ever think of maybe becoming an apprentice or? or is I, I think she's too tall. You must remember that um, I'm not a very big guy, and Sharon's not a very big guy. But but Sharon's brother. Craig Gilchrist was a Springbok basketball captain for about 10 years. He's sure. six foot seven. Dan so Sharon's half sister, so she's, six foot she's two. She's thrown back and to the, back in the pedigree. Yeah, 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 she's thrown back to the pedigree. Yeah, yeah. And she is a vegan. She's got a very healthy lifestyle and she weighs about 56 and a half. She did have aspirations to become a jockey, okay. which I said to her, she, she's going to be too big. It's yes, not a yes. career I really want to, do, to pursue because I feel that the weight will get the better of her. And it's a very tough career. So, I mean, so you look at Rachel. Rachel's getting heavy, but she started also riding from a very young age. She's a very, very competent writer, Rachel. And if you look throughout the world today, it's incredible how the lady jockeys are rising to the top. Yeah. Yeah. You look at yeah. Australia, you look at Holly Doyle, Turner, you look at America. America had the top Judy Crones in the old days, etc. But it's quite incredible to see how well the woman jockeys are doing. And one's got to take your hat off to yeah, them absolutely. because it's a, it's a damn tough sport. I think they're more determined than the, the average 
Yeah. Maybe it's male. Yeah, yeah absolutely right. So I mean, determined to make it in the that, industry. That, that ride yesterday where she beat Diego or Michael's horse, the horse's name escapes me, but she's, yeah, and we saw her this morning, she really is in, in a good space and she's in a good head space too. Let's talk about some of, we're going to touch on your owners in a moment because it would be remiss if we didn't do that, but some top quality horses, you'll obviously remember because you were involved a lot young, a lot before I was. I remember Harry Zecker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some top, top horses. Touch on a couple. We, we'll sit here all day if you talk about all the top horses you've trained, but yeah. touch on a couple, especially Harry's Echo. Well, look, I've been fortunate. You know, my first grade one winner was Harry Hill. I bought him from my uncle and a guy called Basil Tully um, from the late uh, um, DeVette, what was the old man's name? But anyway, Dan DeVette's Heel. his son, um, Heel DeVette. No, not Heel DeVette. No, no, it was um, the old breeder. Goodness, I've forgotten. Dan DeVette's his son. I don't know why I've gone blank. Um, and Harry Hill was by a very unfashionable stallion, Mecca Road. He'd come into the country, he was out of a Mexico mare, Mecca Road, did, one didn't know much about him. And he was a little horse, and I tell you, a really a Shetland pony. He battled to make 15 hands, but he was perfect. He was the perfect racehorse, a hand too small, you know, with this big bum. And having finished my career, I started with Neville Pierce, came back from, I did my army training in the police force. I used to tip to the to the brigadier in Quasimodo Natal and the and the colonel in the southern region, and I was a very big punter as an assistant trainer. Do you know that all the trainers I worked for over nine and a half years as an assistant trainer, I was never paid a salary. Sure. And um, Brian Passmore was, always couldn't believe what a great punter I was. How I knew the form. I knew every horse's form inside out. I mean, that's all I used to do all day. Today, you know, one's so busy with so many things. Uh, I remember the old horses. I can't remember my, the last winner I had what he's by. You know, it's just <laughs> a strange how it works. But there's so much more going on there. In those days, you lived, ate, and slept every race Oops. card, every pedigree. And that's, that's why you were so involved. And that was the turn on, you know. But it started with Harry Hill. He won the computer form sprint sure. and record time. He held the course record at Turfentine when he won the centenary sprint at Turfentine in 1988. They were drying the course with the helicopter that morning. And Harry Hill had a very weak immune system. He used to race with this high white cell count and he forever had viruses. He was iron sound, but while well, he had viruses all the time, he would throw these temperatures from nowhere. And I mean, he won, I think, nine races and he won three features, he won that centenary sprint and he'd won the Germiston Cup, the one day Robin Singh didn't ride him, Van Boomer rode him in, at Germiston. Um, but when he won the computer form sprint, he did it in record time, but the race before that, two months before that, I said it was Turfentine turned 100 years, they had eight feature races. He beat a horse of Herman Browns that came and won the grade one Gilbys that year, I think it was Bold West. But he won by five lengths and broke the course record. That was held for 10 years and broken by Tommy Hotspur. Yes. And in fact, I had a lot of good Lebanese friends and I was very cocky in those days. You know, as you are when you're young, you know everything, you're very confident. <laughs> and I had a lot of money on this horse in anybody's language. And I used to, from, from the days of working for the Passmores, we used to raid Johannesburg a lot with a huge amount of success. I used to go up and saddle the horses. And then, so they got to know me. And then of course, I used to raid Johannesburg a lot with all those good horses. And every time they won, we ran, they almost won. But these were real, real horses. When I tell you, you know, Harry Hill, Harry Zeko, Senor Santa, even a few others, ordinary horses, Mr. Mickey Mouse's odd horses I took for small features, always did well, Sunset Glows, What a Chance. You know, we can go through a number of them. But, and they, they, they loved me, you know, and I said to them, empty out, no race. Now you can imagine a trainer doesn't often say that, but when you're young and you're still a bit stupid, <laughs> and I told them, empty out. It's impossible for him to get beat. And he, he, he literally won by five legs, and they carried me from the back of the stand to, used to have a hedge, the, 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 the winning enclosures were outside the jockey room, you know, they carried me, I was quite embarrassed, you know, the young guy with a moustache, you know, being carried out like 28, well, you know, 1988. So they, uh, all of them so that. thrilled they picked you up, carried you through. Because I gave them so much confidence, you know. Mm. It's, yeah. it's funny, that, that started with that, and Harry's Echo we bred, we never sold, my dad and myself, because we raced distant Echoes, and um, he went to the select sale, there, there was hardly a bid on him, and to be honest, I said to my dad, let's sell him and buy Hamilton Hill, I preferred Hamilton Hill as a specimen, it was also by Harry Hotspur, because I was, I can't say how, you know, uh, he, he in David Payne. I was with Harry Hotspur, you he know, because David I, Payne, I yeah, think, yeah. yeah, and Hamilton Hill, he didn't, he started with, um, the guy who raced a lot of horses in the Cape, his son Winshaw, Jeff Winshaw's Jeff Winshaw, son. Yeah. His son trained him to start with, stopped training, and then he went to Hamilton. And in fact, Harry's Echo beat Hamilton in the short head and the Rupert Ellis Brown at Clarewood. And that year we'd had so much rain, the horses, 
literally never worked for a month. There's a picture of me leading him in with my cousins. My face was on the floor. I thought we got beat. I was so aggravated because the horse was, they were all so unfit, but he was, I was very cautious. Some trainers would take a chance, hack around the turn. You know, I was so worried about breaking down these few horses that, you know, you become over cautious. And he was so, and I thought we'd got beat. Anyway, he had one with Ronald Singh. <laughs> There's a picture of me leading. Everyone says, why are you so depressed when you let him win? I said, I actually thought we got beat. They said, go to the first box. I didn't believe it, you know. And then, of course, along came Senor Santa. And one doesn't need to, yeah. to embellish on how good Senor Santa was, you know. Um, at that stage, Stuart Ramsey had horses with me, and the late Neil Sykes was quite friendly with me, and George Rolls, I used to play a lot of golf in the money schools with George Rolls, Dave, uh, all the bookmakers, um, Brian Robertson, you know, we had this money school every Monday. And I walked down the first fairway one day at Durban Country Club, and I said to Des Scott, and Des Scott knew me well through racing, and very fond, lovely man, Des Scott, and he said, I told him how good this horse was, you know, and he said to me, you know, these young trainers, you young trainers. What you do know, you know? Was, uh, Millard and Payne, you don't know what you're talking about. I said, there's, there's nothing in South Africa that will come close to it. And I said, for, don't forget, it's not just the good horses either. I mean, when you've got two grade one horses, Harriel and Harry's Echo, and they, he couldn't go slow enough for them. He sure. couldn't go slow enough for them. Yeah. He, his first race, we ran him in a winner's race at Clarewood with Ronald Singh. Eight runners, seven winners on the 9th of February. He walked around the ring in the morning and the late Aubrey Roberts, he was, so, he was such a gross horse that I used to cant him about three times a week in the afternoons as well because he was terribly lazy, really lazy, he loved his food, he was permanently on diet and he was basically looked obese and I'd been on television telling Martin Locke <laughs> and Christmas already, Stuart Ramsey I think let, the, let it out the bag how good Senor Santa was and they sang a little song, Michael as he had that expensive horse Mr. Hawaii. And then okay. they sang a little song on a Sunday morning on Michael Lock, Michael Lock's show, uh, you know, you better beware, Senor Santa's coming to town. You know, <laughs> so, so there was no chance of us getting on. He opened two to one in 10 seconds. He was six to 10 against eight winners. Jeez. He was slow. Out the, he went through the junction at Clearwood. He was four lengths behind the second last horse. He won by five. Jeez. And Colin Buckham told Stuart Ramsey in the ring, if that horse wins this race, he'll, he'll eat it. <laughs> and funny enough, the late Aubrey Roberts, and I was friendly with him from when I was young, and you know, Aubrey was also quite a cocky guy, he came to my ring, he used to, to ring just in front of me. And he said, Reverend, I hear they're all talking about this horse, I've got to see this horse. And he was having a quick walk at the track with his work rider. And I, I couldn't, I, I mean, I was like this, you can imagine. I mean, you told everyone how good this was. You, you're lining yourself up to get it to wrong. Get, yeah, like yeah. a real idiot, you know. Yeah. And um, Aubrey Roberts said, that can't win. That's as fat as a pig. I said, it works three times as it works harder than most horses yeah and it's on that you know <laughs> and um uh, that's how good senior center was i mean he was you, just one phenomenal how animal. many two wins in total did he have well, he ends up winning 16 don't forget I, I used to own a share with him with the cordry brothers but after 16. he won the smirnoff as a two-year-old um you know they wanted him to, to breed with him and he was very heavy he wasn't a very good legged horse he was a short past and a little bit upright had to watch his joints as a young horse never unsound but the warning you know wear and tear was there from early him, on yeah. mm. so one wanted to take him take him along slowly and you know after the guineas in cape town he was very poorly ridden by gavin house circled the field at the fastest 400 to finish in the slowest time if he ran off the course you imagine being in cape town you've got the favorite for the guineas he draws three turns for home last the guy circles the track he doesn't corner in fact i had a french horse michael roberts we galloped in the mist before the guineas and michael roberts rode a french horse for me and michael said to me and that's when i knew i was in trouble because there's not too many of them shrewder than Michael. We couldn't see. They delayed the gallops. It was so misty and un unusual for, for, for um, you know, Cape Town. And they came around and Senior Santa was about a length in front of the source. And although he was a listed stakes winner overseas, he wasn't nearly ready, you know. And Michael said, that horse won't take the corner. And then I went to speak to him and said, what are you talking about? He said, Gavin Howes ran off the track with him. He said, this was battle to take the corner. And um, that's what happened in the Guineas. He circled the field. He suddenly realized they'd gone slow. I wanted him placed because he... Yeah. But that, he, that was the Milton near That was that Milton near You remember how short it was? Two yeah. furlong running. Yeah. He ran. You, you're watching the video. You know, the television, SABC in those days. I can't remember. It wasn't... I think it was on Super Sport. It wasn't Super Sport, but whatever the, the, the program, top sports sport. channel, the top, top sport, sport. There we yeah, go. Right. And he ran. You see him come running. He runs out the picture. <laughs> 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 you know, and got beat 2.8 lengths. So my mood wasn't good. I can I tell can you. Imagine. But anyway, we eventually parted ways. But he was... A great horse, and it was sad that I had to, to lose him, you know. Tony, um, owners, let's quickly chat on some of your owners. You've had some fabulous patrons. You still, to this day, have some fabulous patrons, and, and nobody would get offended or mind if I, if I mention in particular 
Mary Lally, who's been in the game for so long, and just she's just a classy, uh, um, chic lady. She doesn't look her age. She's just yeah. loving every second of it. Yeah, listen, Warren. I mean, I must be honest. I think if it wasn't for Mary Lally, I would have stopped training by now because I don't have a. I'm not a big marketer. You know, I don't go out there looking to market myself. I'm a bit old-fashioned that way and I'm busy with so many things that I really don't have the time to do those sort of things. What I do pride myself on is that I have a lot of experience in the game. I know horses backwards. I know how to look after them. Um, you know, they always... I don't send horses to the start going down short or maybe scratchy. I'm a bit of an old woman and I am a little bit conservative in that respect. But it's just the way I was taught as a youngster to do things and that's so, the sorry, way it is. You know? sorry, sorry to interrupt you there before we continue about Mary and your owners that you mentioned that you've, you have developed a bit of a reputation it's a good reputation that you're very pedantic and that you are very um, strict and, and follow you know if your horses are not a hundred percent right they don't run if the yeah. blood's out or if it's you, you you don't run unless you're happy 100 percent so if you see a tony rivlin horse at the races you know the game you know, not the game's on but you know that that horse is going to give his best yeah. or her best yeah look you know obviously we've digressed a bit and we'll get back to the owners but you know warren i mean ultimately the punters punt on these horses and i believe that horses should run close to their form no horse can win every time he goes to the race course they have but you want a horse to reproduce his best form as much as is humanly possible as a trainer yes. to get him to do so. Yeah. Because that's, what's, that's the game without the punter, without the guy wagering on our product. Um, we don't have an industry. We've got to realize that. So wherever they're wagering, whether they're wagering in South Africa or they're wagering overseas because we're telecasting the product somewhere overseas, people need to have confidence in the product. I always say to people, racing is a game of skill because about 35 or 36 percent of the favorites win. And if you couple it with the second favorites, that percentage jumps to about 66 percent. Well, you can't go to a casino and say, Reds will come up you know, they will come up 50% of the time, I suppose, that's the way it works, but in what order you wouldn't know. At least you go to the race course, if you don't like the favourite and you back the second favourite, you can work out and you also know which favourites are false favourites. Right. You know, Anton Marcus rides many false favourites and I do feel for him. Uh, people automatically assume because he's on a horse, sometimes you're riding for those big stables, people, ride, yeah, he is the top jockey, sure. people will naturally assume that that is the right horse in the race and people do follow the top jockeys and rightly so why wouldn't you follow the riders that win the most races yeah. they have the choice of a lot of rides in a lot of cases especially with the larger stables the smaller stables not necessarily so because you'll be you you've, you've got one jockey that's riding quite a bit of work and you'll try and throw him most of the rides but getting back to clients I, I mean i have been fortunate you know when you when i think about it i've trained for the doyens of the people that have been in the racing industry george rolls you know, we'll start with him because I love George Rolls. He was a very good friend of mine. Um, he loved the racing industry and he was a participant from when he was also six years of age uh, living at, um, you know, yeah, Amazon used, Toti riding remember, horses yeah. for his father. You yeah, know, riding those, all yeah. those, those bush races. That's and correct. Him and, and, and the Benji places, Johnson, yeah. the Scots, and, and died. The Scots' clients. Um, I mean, yeah, if I had to Chris go back. Saunders, Chris, Chris Saunders. Saunders. I was going to get to Chris Saunders. And then at later years, but Chris, I was very friendly with Chris from when he had horses with Aubrey Roberts and then Mike Airy because Chris was a real gentleman, a very staunch man. And he always said to me, when Mike Airy stops one day, if he stops, you'll get the horses, which I did. You know, I used to send quite a few, a few to Mark de Kock, and it was wonderful going to the farm with him. And he was, these were the people that, you know, used to stand on the stand as a young guy. And you used to, a young guy in racing, you had to wear a tie in those days, all dressed up, and you'd be mingling with the mink and manure of society. From the Harry Oppenheimers, I remember following Harry Oppenheimer one day at Gravel, and he went and had a bet on his horse. And I think he had five rand wins and five rand places, and I was standing behind. And knowing that, and I was at school, you know, maybe 17, um, knowing that, you know, they were obviously the richest man in South Africa, um, I thought to myself, I wonder what thrill he's getting having five wins in five places. And I'll never forget my dad saying, it's not about the money. He could have, it's the money, it's, it's not, yeah. it, money has absolutely nothing to do with this. It's the thrill of actually wagering some money on something and you were right. And yeah. it's your horse and being able yeah. to participate yeah. in this victory. And so I never forgot that, you know, but that was what it was like. And of course, Getting back to Mary Lali now, who's like my second mother and, 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 you know, I mean, we're very close and I'm very fond of her and she has been one of the stalwarts of the racing industry. I think she's had colours for 61 years. Because sure. one must remember that she was married to, to the late 
Herman, uh, Junior's grandfather, yeah. so sure. senior Herman's father, yeah. you know, and okay. that's how long she's been, and so she's always participating, she loves her racing, she, she's having a little wager anywhere in the country, PE, Cape Town, Johannesburg, you know, I mean, that's what we need in racing, that's what we don't have today, a lot of the new people that even have come into racing, and they own a lot of horses, they don't like wagering, Mary loves to have a bet, and that is so important, when people start turning and saying, I don't like to bet, I know we're in trouble straight away, mm -hmm. because unfortunately, it's like walking to a clothes shop and saying, I don't want to spend any money on clothes, Clothing, no matter, yeah, it's yeah. Too I mean, yeah. if people aren't spending yeah. money, economies dry up, yeah. money needs to turn around for everybody to do well, yeah. and we just, I'm just fortunate, and then I've had other old clients that have been with me forever on and off, you know, Robert Mango, the Gerard de Roval, who's related to me, is on and off, had horses with me. Um, Knut Hoag, the Hoags, used to have horses with me, you know, on and off. Um, Knut about four times, you know, like he's had with a number of trainers. <laughs> but I mean, a great patron, used to pay his bills very well. Difficult to, to keep because, you know, yeah. it just... I don't but think I mean, he has some any very horses. Good horses. No, he doesn't have any more. But horse. it's a pity that we lost people like that. Alan yes. Burke, Charlie Good, great Charlie mate of mine, good, used yeah. to support me. And, you know, I, I, there are so many of them from the old days that, I, you know, I'm going to forget people that sure, I, I'll, sure. I'll regret afterwards, you know, not mentioning. But I also seem to find that the... The modern owner is it's not as clued up as the, as the old, old guys. Yeah. That um, is a good point, yeah. The modern owner, and it's not, it's not a disrespectful comment. Going back to those years, I mean, those, as you say, were the, 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 the think and proper. You know, the modern owner is maybe not as educated as the olden day owner. You've got a good point. No, I know. I mean, I, you can go into any pub and, and, and discuss horses, and, and you know, they'll tell you things that maybe you didn't actually remember or, or yeah. know, and they'll, they'll give you some information. Okay. okay. No. But Andrew, you're so right. I mean, think about it. We used to, when I was, as I said, I've been racing since I was nine years school. I remember that out of season, we only raced on a Saturday, yeah. on a weekend. Mm. You know, you'd only race in season, you would you race on the Wednesdays as well. And then it, eventually it was two times, um, you'd, you know, two times a week. You didn't have television in those days. You didn't have those programs. We used to study that race card. At that stage, it was Duff's Turf Scard. Tell you what used to happen in our house. And the people say, why did you get hooked? <laughs> I was, you know, a reasonably intelligent child, and so they taught me in this big red book. It was an, an alphabetical book, and we had every trainer's name, and Brian Passmore, my dad, Serge Beggar, you know, these people that we used to come and punt every... So every... During the week, I used to get home from school often, and all the Duff's Turf Scout I used to go through, and all the comments, just like a computer form would be today, they ruled lines for me, and I used to write out uh, yeah. 3rd of December, Gravel, the reference number, so that we had all the Duff's Turf Scout could yeah. go back and, and reference, and then you'd see where the horse came from, and you know, and yeah, yeah. Pass would say, that had a look last time, I don't think it was ready. And we used to take, there was only PAs, jackpots, duplers, winners, and so yeah. I mean, there weren't a, a variety of bets, bets like you yeah. have today. And, that's all the owner used to do. I mean, Mary Lyle used to tell me, they used to wait for the race card to come out. Wait for the, com the Duff Turf card and you'd, and then when later years, computer form mm. and the blue book, you know, it was, I think, uh, I can't remember, it was for the gold yeah. corn, Selwyn, Elk, I can't even remember all the blue book they had. And, and these, that's all you used to do. You used to have to go back and say, but we do market racing as a game of skill. If you really want to keep the youngsters involved, it's a game of skill. skill Why yeah. do people follow rugby? You sit in the stand, we all experts, the ref didn't know what he was doing. Yeah. Got, you know, cricket, uh, it, wasn't a, you know, it wasn't an outside edge, we know better. But today with technology, it's a lot yeah. more accurate. In those days, we were all guessing. You know, and we all, we all the greatest uh, yeah. uh, armchair umpires. But also in the old days, I mean, you used to go anywhere and, and speak to someone and the bloke would put his hand in his back pocket and after it would come the race court. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <So> <laughs> it was, it was know, just a thing that you carried around all the time. You, you, but you, then, one of you must remember, there was no gaming allowed. No, we lived in a society where, you know, Sunday you couldn't race, you couldn't buy anything at the shop in the, in the 70s and, you know, you and people forget that. Closed, so yeah. we lived in a very conservative society. So um, racing was the only form of gaming allowed. And I think it's exclusivity is what made it so successful. Yeah. And of course, the awe of horses and also it was the, as I said, it was the, it was the era of, it was the halcyon days of racing. If you read Vincent O'Brien's book and Robert Sangster's book, when you think about it, it was the late 70s and the 80s that racing was really commercialized because that was the era of Northern Dancer where syndicating stallions became a pathway to huge financial reward yeah. and it still is today you look at australia you syndicate these stallions you win a few grade ones as a two-year-old in australia you can syndicate a horse for 30 million dollars sure. yeah. you know and when you think of the cost of keeping a horse with it you just hope he's healthy yes. and that he's he's not impotent and that he's yeah. fertile because yeah. it's just the greatest annuity income you can it's ever, ever had, yeah. you know there's yeah. no business model like that and i think 
That's what we forget a little bit, that that's why people honed into it. And then it, it, was a, it was an aspiration to be an owner. I mean, to get colors in those days, you literally, uh, it was, it it was, it was interview. anal. Yeah. Yeah. It goes through an interview, that goes through your bank interview, account. Bank yeah. statements, that, I remember my dad being very unhappy having to divulge all that information. He yeah. thought it was, um, you know. Not um, their business. It, it's not, it had none of their business, yeah. I mean, you know. Um, today we you fill in a form, name, address, telephone number, and Sign you get colours. Yeah. 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 I suppose with modern era, that's right. It's it's a commercial decision that the trainer must make whether or not to yes. to if a guy's you know got a reputation of not being a good payer, don't take him. But you know yeah. along the lines, it's not as easy as that. Sure, it's more sure, complicated, sure. and trainers do take a lot of risk today. They do take uh, a lot of risk. Just going back to that comment you said, you know, about everybody would have a race card in their back pocket. Just a, a funny little story. Well, not a funny story. An interesting story. I was on holiday a couple of years ago in our lovely hometown of Mauritius because obviously Tony mentioned that he's Mauritian and so am I and also our family and we went to Montrose Beach. It was a public holiday and into the water we go, a magnificent swim and my brother-in-law was with me who knows nothing about horse racing and he said to me, can you notice something? I said, yes. I said, it's magnificent. The water, the trees, the filaho trees and the distance, it's beautiful. He said, look again. I looked there and there was a beach was packed, public holiday, all the locals. I have so a sea of race time magazine. They were all lying on the beach relaxing and every family had a copy of the race time magazine. I couldn't believe it. I get goosebumps when I was here. And I, I've actually got a photograph. I'll try and get it and show we took a photo. That, I mean, you go to the Durban beaches today, nobody's got a newspaper, let alone a yeah. form guide. Yes, I know that I think horse racing was the national sport or was or is the, of Mauritius, but yeah. the point I'm saying is the whole country was just passionate about yeah. the sport. And to see the beach, never mind the, the people on the beach, and just to see everybody reading the race car. They were lying on the, on the beach reading their race car. It comes back to exclusivity. In Mauritius, there's no entertainment. It's a little island of a million people. What do you do? on the weekends yeah. and you know the racetrack situated right in the heart of Port Louis people in the morning before going to work actually go to Port Louis and watch the horses Gallops, work yeah, it's yeah. interesting they have a bun uh, you know the, the, yeah. all the different French uh, yeah. little croissants uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. etc and you know dal and yeah, then yeah. in the morning with a cup of coffee and they watch and it, that's what it is all week you you're deciding what you're going to wage on and it's yeah. it's that's what drove the interest and it still drives the interest in Mauritius although it's waning yes, it's in trouble yes, it's waning yes, yeah, the youngsters yeah. have there's too many of these things yes. telephones and online gaming online yeah. gaming is the biggest Big threat thing. to all wagering yeah. Yeah. today yeah. because um, not I mean I say wagering online game but games games these these games that are released into the into circulation in the East the amount of money that is exchanged and games between generally elder people but children mainly it's 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 reached into the billions of dollars. Yeah, sure. It's frightening, and a lot of that revenue is not coming back into circulation. So, I think there's a lot of challenges, you know. And unfortunately, racing just isn't the, the only game in town. And I don't know how we're going to get the youngsters to become as passionate as we were. I don't think we ever will. We've just got to keep working on it. Yeah, know, I, I, don't I don't think I answer. think those days are gone now I because do think gone, I mean, most most young people live in t in, in cities. They've never seen a horse before. Yeah. yeah. Live yeah. in the middle of the Think you're going to see a horse? I don't know. What's a horse? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's interesting that you say that because how do we get people, new young people, interested? I mean, I was walking at Macro some time ago at Springfield Park. They've opened up, reopened, and they were obviously doing promotions. I was walking down the aisle, and a guy came up to me. He said, "Oh, can, you know." He said, "Do you fish?" I said, "Fish." I said, "No, no, no." He said, but I know a few people that do. He said, well, please, just come and speak five minutes and let me show you this new rod. Da, 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 da. He said, you know, you might want to try it. I said, I have absolutely no desire to try it at all. And, and that made me think because, you know, you go up to somebody, a stranger, and you say, well, do you have a bet? No. You know, well, come racing. I have, you know, that person said, well, I have no desire. What can we, what can we do to get that person to get the desire? I, what I'm saying is I had no desire to fish. If, if you told me there was never a fishing rod to be bought again, I wouldn't mind. Yeah. You would. How do you get but somebody interested if they're not interested? That's also, a, uh, what's, what's where we, we sort of stuck at the moment is to try and get the, sort of the black population uh, yeah. to own horses and to get, become interested in horses. I mean, you're sitting there with what between the Indians, the whites and the coloreds are about 10% of the population. Yeah. Mm. And the other 90%, we've got to drag them in and, and yeah. make it. In, yeah, and toss them but the, the, I don't know how to answer. If they say, "Well, why should I come to the races? Why must I have a bet?" I don't know yeah. how to really answer because it's exciting. And he says, "Well, how's it exciting? I haven't tried it." I said, "But yes, you must try it." 
come and yeah. enjoy the music and the Bourbois rolls and the Durban view. I anyway, think, yeah, you know, it's, Warren, it's, it's most probably um, it would be a strategic decision that the racing industry would have to make in South Africa to throw a lot of resources in it. It would have to be a, a macro strategy where we target kids at school in their standard nine and matric years, years yeah. because by bringing them to the racing, bringing them to the training centers, but you would have to expend a lot of cash and a lot of energy and have a, a marketing budget that's sufficient to keep at it. And I always used to say when I served on, and I started serving in the tell owners and trainers since from 1987, and even my days in the gold circle boards and on note, I used to say, you know that maybe what we need to do as an industry is people in South Africa, what are our favorite sports? They soccer, rugby and cricket okay those are the the main sports that we used to focus on and in the days of newspaper i remember when i was at dhs and matric i'd often like to pop into the library really to have a look at the racing page but i'd love to have a look was the the paper was full of racing information but you also look at the other sports the cricket fixtures or the soccer fixtures obviously no television and, and the modern telephones today with this today you can give people an inordinate amount of information at their fingertips but to get them really interested you've got to bring them to summerfeld they've got to but it takes a lot of effort and a lot of energy and you've got to persevere and you've got to keep at it because you've got to bring them along they've got to start to feel for the horse it's interesting yes. whenever we have people visit this training facility obviously because i'm one of the senior trainers and the manager yeah um it's tony riven and also because you know i end up having the patience to do it i suppose they come to my yard these are people that have know nothing about racing and they walk through the barn and feed the horses carrots even gold circles finance department was here last last week they work for gold circle they're in the finance department and it was an eye opener for them what actually they happens in a race yeah. and horses and how they behave and, and, and what we feed them and how they're maintained and what goes on, the actual routine. Once people get involved at that level, because I, as much as I, I love the punting, the punting and the excitement of having a bet and watching horses, but there's something about a racehorse. It's yes. definitely great for the soul of an, for the inside of a man. 100%. You know, that old adage, I think, rings true because you look at the girls, how quickly they get hooked on horses. I mean, they are hooked. On, once you're hooked on a horse, you hooked it. Eh? And I think the Australians have been very successful in that they have marketed racing to people in a way that's also, it's, it's become part of their DNA. Do you know that in Australia, one in 200 people own a share in a race? Yeah, sure. Okay, it's a first world country where you have low unemployment and it's, it's very well marketed in Australia and there's a lot of money. It's, a, it's an industry. I mean, it's the third largest industry in Australia. They, they have their own minister. In, in parliament in racing and that's the and that's sure. what we also need to do with our government make them realize that it is a very labor intensive sport and in a country where we need to keep people employed yeah. and especially people that have been unfortunate not to be very well educated because how do you become a groom we have groom schools but they they're very um they're very very basic what happens is the families have worked with horses from the trans car and so the kid gets interested in it and that's how you're going to create the next generation of punters sure. and people who mm. own horses and I even thought from university students first and second university or third year university students target them give them these guys are going to be the future successful people in your in your economy in their final year or two have these racing evenings where they come to the races where you give them a free meal where you let them come into the parade ring and we need to have you know grow this fractional ownership in in, in a better way and we need to become transparent in racing completely transparent let's face it we all inclined to especially for me i know you've got to you come from the old school and i've become you know i've gone from the sublime to the ridiculous you know where i was so overconfident i was young you get older and you become a bit more conservative, conservative and yeah. and you know in the old days i don't know I, I'm, you can hear I'm an, an old dinosaur, but the jockeys in those days, you know, we were close, the trains were close, they could tell you something when you worked towards. I find a lot of the modern jockeys, they actually haven't got a clue whether a horse can win or not. Because I'll ask them, and I know about what they're telling me. Mm. Some have got an idea, but a lot of them might be able to ride a horse well. Yes. But I'll tell you what, get off horse and tell you, unless it gallops exceptionally. Yes. It's not... The, the, the uh, feedback's Jimmy, not there you know, anymore. Jimmy Anderson, when I worked for Ivan Pickering, could canter us. If it was running that week and he'd come back and tell you this or will not won't win until he was right eight out of sure. nine out of ten times sure. brian possum these the billy of the mccready's even you know uh, some not all the great jockeys mm. but it's but incredible those, 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 those jockeys actually horses. live by their wits that so that they, they had to they, they had, had to be to good judges they, they had, had to. to go i mean martin schumann and, and raymond rhodes and uh, james murray these guys if they told you what was going to win they were right nine out of ten, ten times. times today it's um 
it's not quite the same. No, eh? Just, pa 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 just collect your writing fee and that's the go. Yeah. Home, yeah. Um, Tony, let's talk about two people quickly. Patrick Rivel and your cousin, who, you know, obviously through marriage, uh, distant cousin, uh, you know, we're all linked up and, and related somewhere along the line. And just so wonderful to see him come back into racing. And he's having with Fenella and the whole family uh, some success. They've, they've got some nice horses. And I also want you to touch, so I ask you to touch on Patrick and, and, and passionate man. And, and of course, Terry, your assistant. Touch yeah. on those two gentlemen. Yeah, well, look, I mean, my late uncle, Claude, my dad's brother, obviously also had a great interest in horses. He owned uh, Harry's Echo with us. He, we, we sold a share of Harry's Echo to him. He owned Harry Hill. I mean, he, was, he, he really, you know, helped me to establish myself because he was very supportive of me and they loved the racing industry. He was a chartered accountant. He was a successful man. And so Patrick grew up in a family also that was, Sean, not so much. He's not that interested. Patrick has loved it. And he's become more, he's become totally hooked the older he's got. He's a qualified lawyer. Um, you know, he, he works he, he works for Anchor Capital. But he's he gets so excited. It, it, it always it amazes me. And in fact, Victory Trish runs in my late uncle's colours. It's that green, green, the yes, green that's and the right. red and the back. So, you know, it's great. I'm so pleased for Patrick that in a small way, and Patrick takes, you know, fairly small percentages in horses, that I've been able to give him success with, with really inexpensive horses. And every one of them wins a race or two or three. Prince of Taranto will still win a few more victory twists. Um, you know, he's having fun. He's got shares in one or two youngsters. And it's great that Mary Lally has also been willing to take these shares with them. Because normally Mary doesn't need to have partners, she doesn't like partners, I and mean, she's by far my biggest client. I only have 30 in training, of which Mary most probably has got 20, you know. So the rest are friends of mine, and it's the Southern Idus have raced with me for a long time, Michelle and the Rack. You know, Michelle and myself go back from, to the, to, you know, the dates, days when Michelle was at Varsity and running restaurants. Um, I used to frequent his restaurants with the odd young lady <laughs> that I was trying to impress, you know, and we loved racing together, and we've, and so Michelle, you know, I have, all the clients that I have, they're all friends of mine. Generally, the clients I have, they more than, in the main, they, they're people that have been with me a long time. They know me, they know my personality, they, they understand me. And that's important. I think in a relationship like that, it's very important to understand. In the old days especially, you know, the older day trainers, they could be very sharp and we don't just talk about Ormond. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah, these old trainers, yeah. the Jackie Gortons and... If you, you don't know, like it, Passmore take your horse you know, and... It's very, mm. you know, you're there to do a business for the guy. Pay your bills, you know your horse will get the best care, I'm there to try and win races f for you. And that's really where it is, oh, you know, yeah, there's, there's there, a lot of them didn't even like to, to, to socialise with their clients. But I think a lot of successful trainers realised too that it was important it was to socialise yeah, to a yeah, degree. Absolutely. Because I think you've got to establish some sort of friendship, because let's face it, it's not an exact science. Owners have to be passionate about it because they ultimately are the largest supporters of the racing industry. Because breeders really breed horses in the old days. The, the very well-heeled people will race horses for fun against each other. They'll breed because it's, a, it's quite a status to say, I'll breed a better horse than you and they'll race. But they, even them, at the, at the money they're putting, if you look at the Drakensteins and the, and the Wilkerbostrifts and the Main Chance Farms and the Ridgemont, these people are putting huge amounts of capital. They're never going to get that back. But the thrill of breeding those great horses and racing against each other and having horses, whether you own them or whether you've sold them at a sale and they're racing with another owner, to win those greater races. There's a, there's a wonderful sense of achievement and thrill you get out of that. And I think we must never forget that. And owners subsidize the industry to the tune today of about 600 million rand. Sure. You know, COVID, the numbers have changed a little bit. But if you look at the capital cost of purchasing the horses, the training fees and all your ancillary service providers, from veterinary surgeons to physiotherapists, therapists to transporters to insurers insurance agents to that 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 whole host of ancillary service providers it's and the stakes that are on offer bear in mind that the total stakes that are on offer the winner gets 62 and a half percent the second horse gets 20 percent mm. by mm. far the bulk of prize money just goes to those two those participants two, yeah, yeah. so there's many more losers than winners and owners have got to understand that they're going to lose their money but from the trainer's duty is to look after us the best you can try and give the guys much fun as he can and that's why i enjoy it when my owners come and have a breakfast with me and walk through the barn and then they see when you're there busy bandaging a horse and this horse has come back from the track and it's kicked the rail on the way back because there's the horse is fresh and well or he's rolled and he's got caught up against the rail and he's about to run may not you know, it's not life-threatening, but he's there to run now. You've got three days interruption to the program while you get him right. People have got to understand a little bit about that. This is a flat animal, highly strung. When you've got them at their peak, 
There's yeah, a yeah. lot going on, and yeah. these things, and you've got to understand that. And thank goodness, people like Mary Lovey, she understands all this. She has patience, and you know, when you got horses with me, Robert Bloomberg was to always laugh. You know, my two olds are three olds, and three olds are four olds. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the two olds I don't run that many. Um, I, I do now and again, you know, and when they run a two old, they generally do well, or they're showing absolutely nothing, nothing and they forward, and then yeah. we decide quickly one two runs. I don't believe in hanging on to horses, Warren, that that don't look like they're going to make it, because to be honest little money what I put into this is not a business I do my budgets every year and as you know I've provided budgets to the newspapers you've published them once or twice I understand the two to the half kg but you look at it I've just had a load of Ote arrived today I mean it's obscene the price we have to pay for it I mean if I win the budget we wouldn't be feeding these horses in here yeah. we've yeah. had eight feed increases concentrate feed increases in two years sure. eight increases very difficult to run a business yeah, that and when, you, when you're looking at you sort of like 20 bags a day oh yeah, yeah. yeah and, and it's it the, adds up and you know bidding. Bidding. i mean Very it costs me at the bidding. moment yeah. about 920 rand a month okay when the new stables are slightly larger but you know if you want decent bedding in a horse's stable it's 922 rand just to bed a horse down you know That's and yes you can skimp a grip and put in g but you know i'm past that if i've got to train that way i'd rather not train Enough, horses yeah, because there's a level for me, you know, if, if, if that, that few thousand rand is going to make a difference between you being looking after horse absolutely properly or not, I'd say pursue yeah, another hobby. Yeah, you know, that's yeah, just, yeah. but I may, you know, I may not be correct in that. Yeah, so, but, but you, you're so right. The owners have got to understand that it's tough. You've got to have a great sense of humor, deep yeah, pockets, but yeah. you've got to trust your trainer that he's doing the best, that he knows what he's doing, yeah. and he's got your and, assets, and, and interest yeah, in And trying to have some fun along yeah, the way, as you say. Well. But yeah. as you, as you uh, uh, mentioned, so well, as we've mentioned, I think it's great that we've mentioned things because a lot of people just think, uh, and I go back to that same old story, I was at the, at, at the races, a lady stopped me, she said, you know, I've come to the races for the first time, she said, it's so wonderful that just, the horses just arrive here and it's, you know, they race yeah. and they go and it's such a lovely, easy game. <laughs> and I said to a man with no disrespect, I said, give me half an hour if you've got, I'll tell you, you know, behind the scenes, and you're right to try. And I think the guys that are doing these videos, etc. I mean, that the insert was Donovan Dillon. You know, Donovan Dillon to see what he has to go through to get down to that weight to ride that horse. Yeah. You know, you got to see what the train is going to do to yeah. get that. It's a, it's, it's, and a lot of people are quick to criticise, but they have no idea what goes on behind mm. the scenes. I'm glad both of you mentioned that. Terry, your yeah. assistant. Yeah. There he is. There. Yeah. There he is. Terry Laughing at his phone. Corner. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Terry loves to come and listen to our podcast live, yeah. and it's nice to have him. But uh, he's been with you a long time, and he yeah. knows his way around a horse. Yeah. Well, Terry's been involved in the racing industry al almost from when he left school as well. You know, and he's worked for a number of trainers. He's worked overseas. He's been very fortunate. He worked for Herman Brown in Dubai and other trainers in Sweden. He's he even went to Serbia. They <laughs> nearly, he nearly never came back there when, when, when <laughs> we, Herman. Were you vaccinated? The Russians there. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, so Terry's been around. He, uh, listen, I give Terry a hard time. I'm not an easy guy to work for. Um, and so Terry, luckily, he's got a good sense of humor. <laughs> and um, but you know, um, people know that I just I'm a bit of a perfectionist by nature. I was just wired that way. And um, but you know, Terry, of course, he, he you've got to get to you know when you have a relationship with somebody who's your assistant trainer because. I'll tell you what, they're the unsung heroes of the racing industry a lot of the time, of the assistant trainers. Yeah, you don't Make see them no at the races, mistake. Yeah. You know, we, we do focus a lot on grooms, but grooms, they come and go, it's a means to an end, um, but the assistant trainers, it's not easy for them yeah. in a lot of these stables. They don't have much time off. Trainers, racehorse trainers are not easy people to deal with because it's, it's the type of game you're dealing with so many negatives all the time. So who do you put the pressure on? You put the pressure on your two RC. It doesn't matter, you know. And, and there's not a lot of time off and they have to put up with a lot of the trainers, SH1T. And yeah, yeah. So, you know, they are definitely the unsung heroes of this racing industry. There's no doubt about that. And I think Terry's worked for me on and off for about 10 or 11 years now. And, but as I say, Terry's worked for the Dennis Bosch. He's worked for all many top trainers. And I think Terry's about 54, 55 years old. So he's also been around a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and there's not many assist. You know what the scary thing is? Succession in this industry. Do you know, most of the trainers are look at us. A lot of us are in our 60s. Yeah. There's a lot of us in our 50s. There's very few young trainers coming yes. through. And I, I don't think there's four registered licensed assistants in Kwazulu Natal. There's Terry, there's Stuart Ferry, there's uh, Nicolette, uh, Nicolette, Nicolette. Nicolette Dean Canamay. But I mean, uh, I'm bobbing and weaving, yeah, you know. Yeah, yes, yeah. you've got Garrett, Gavin van Zale who's got um, Open Sea and, yeah. and Paul who's got Vuzi. And, but I mean, there's not a lot of them, you know. Duncan Howes may have Della, but when you think about it, in the old days, every single trainer had a licensed assistant yeah, trainer yeah, and maybe yeah. even a stable employee. Yeah. So, you know, it just shows because 
let's face it from a career path point of view if we look at it as it stands right now and that's what I can't try and tell my daughter this yeah. from a career path point of view and I think that's why Mark, Matthew de Kock most probably did the right thing to immigrate to Australia mm -hmm. it's a vibrant racing country but you know we South Africans it's, it's hard to it's this hard is to leave. one of the greatest places on earth and yeah. that's why we've got to try and make it work you know mm -hmm. and we've got to we've got to get everyone involved and get mm -hmm. government on side and and try and create some all around racing and one thing you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier Andrew about black guys I think we've also got to have a change of mindset the successful black businessmen today are very wealthy but they in a lot of the if you look at a lot of the elderly white people they've maybe spent a lot of money traveling they've they've done those things it doesn't excite them as much to sit yes, down and drink moe blue label dress with you know dress in a pair of shoes that will cost you six or seven thousand rand but the the upmarket black guys that have got money they want that recognition and let's face it that's why racing grew in the very old days because it was a selected it was an aspirational sport and maybe we need to think of that and maybe we need to r change our mindset a little bit about what we do at the race courses and the type of facilities and maybe we need to offer these blue chip facilities where you can become a member like the Kentucky Club Chris Sanders always used to mention the Kentucky Club to me in, in America how such an upmarket venue where to go there you had to be a member you had to put a tie on you would only eat uh, prawns and langos and, and it cost you money but that's where the very successful businessmen interacted with each other and I went when I went to America in 2000 spent six weeks there on behalf of Gold Circle as a board director we were looking to put a dirt track in it at Maritzburg I went and raced with some of those stewards through Chris Sanders you know and, and the Gold Circle board giving you entree into those those facilities and I could see that some of those facilities that's where people rich guys in the afternoon leave their office their business success they want to come no. and race and enjoy the finest that life yeah. can offer. Maybe it's a bit like, you know, no, I say most, most big business is done on the golf course. Yeah. Get them off the golf course and on the, on the race, race course. course. Yeah, very good point. Yeah. There's two things that we, I know we're running out of yeah, time. We, 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 we see, I said we, to you, I don't want to talk for longer than 20 minutes, but everyone <laughs> tells you I've got verbal diarrhea. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we start these conversations, there's But no that's it, that's it, the you beauty know. of it. Yes, it, uh, you know, we, anyway, uh, just, we're going to start wrapping up, and, and, uh, but yes, you do talk a lot, and it's interesting because you've got a lot of information and knowledge to share. So, yeah, let's let it go for a bit longer, but we're going to have to uh, start thinking about wrapping up. But two things that I must ask you about is you need to tell everybody what is it that what is what is your current role in horse racing that's you know a lot of people say what does tony do because we know that you're actively involved we know that you're passionate we know that you will stick up for racing if it was the last breath in your body yeah. but share with us briefly if that's possible and i'll say that with tongue in cheek um <laughs> what, what do you do i mean what what, okay. what, what does tony Rivlin do what are you yeah. responsible for share yeah. with us tell the yeah. people that yeah look i do live eat and sleep racing and i'm fortunate my family accept it because otherwise i'd be in, in a lot of trouble so really what happened warren is from 1987 i started serving on the owners and trainers associations and it really started because fortunate to have a reasonable education a lot of older trainers you know there were guys that had grown up in racing and yeah. then and then issues would pop up and and it was difficult in those days because racehorse trainers were considered second-class citizens by the stewards and and everyone is well aware of that and um and they weren't allowed, they weren't allowed yeah. in the stewards and you know, at yeah, you know, and you know there was a few trainers that would speak up a little but you know generally they were very subservient to authority and i used to say well this is not right that's not right why well, should one be so i've never been a subservient person i'm just not that i believe in freedom of speech let people have their say providing it's responsible sure. but you know we live in a society where people must be able to have differing views debate them because out of that comes better solutions there is no doubt in my mind we i'm concerned mm. about the world we're living in at the moment because i think there's the news media has taken over they they affect the discourse whether on the left or right of the spectrum to the extent that it's difficult for people to even want to think objectively for fear of, of the reprisals but that's digressing so what really happened is i served in ozone trainers association on and off for a long time because i was interested in every aspect of the sport when i used to travel to asian racing conferences i used to go to the training facilities in 1989 a little snippet for you i brought a guy called joe pagan to south africa no sorry joe pagan was kentucky equine research i also brought to south africa reuben rose he was the preeminent exercise physiologist at sydney university and how i got to know him is that when my mom's family emigrated her aunts to New Zealand and Australia because their daughters married Australians they used to know 
that I was racing mad because they were very wealthy people and they used to, the ship used to dock here and I used to go and eat with them and that, all I used to talk about was racing 9, 10, 11, 12. So Australia being a big racing country, they used to send me books for my birthday written by the late Tommy Smith and all these. And obviously as I got older, um, Reuben Rose had written a book on exercise physiology and I remember I just finished my trick and I read it and, and I then wrote to him and then of course in writing to him, note to the, the direct, I think Dudley Basil the late Dudley Basil, obviously I'm talking about all these people, the late the Martin Sternbergs, Dudley Basil, all these people, Chairman Benji Johnson, but it was Dudley Basil, I think, said, Tony, let's bring him out here. And the old Clearwood owners and trainers behind there, you, you might remember the evening, he was there and he went through, we had an hour and a half, and those are other ways of keeping people interested in horses. So that's, those are the kind of things yes. I enjoy doing. But then obviously I served on the board of Gold Circle from 1999, because when we folded the three turf clubs, we also folded the Breeders Association, the Trainers Association, which I was at that stage, I've always been vice chairman or chairman or vice chairman of the KwaZulu Natal Trainers Association, which I'm very proud to be an active participant in, you know, it's one of my babies. I mean, 31 years we've been going. It's a properly run organization. <coughs> yeah. Audited financials, proper minutes. Um, you know, we're responsible for a lot of, lot of upliftment of the grooms at the moment. And, and we've been very actively involved. And that was the vehicle we used to get to the, to the, the upper echelons of racing in those days and the vehicles we still use. And um, so from there that was folded into Gold Circle, all those associations. So I served on the board till 2012 and then I wanted to pursue one or two other business interests because I was tired. Serving on those boards for that long and, yes. and, and always being involved in the fray and you know and people misunderstand what your role is and then you when things aren't going well you blame when they well you know you, you, you get a pat on the back and it was, I think I was just getting a little I wouldn't say tired of it because I'm still very involved and love it but I needed a break from it you know to be quite honest and Michelle said to me I think I was chairman of the remuneration committee at the time, I'd always been very involved in matters at Summerfield because we employ people, a lot of horticulturists, want of a better word, but agricultural type people to run a training centre. There's so much more to running a training centre. Good financial knowledge is important just from a budgeting point of view, understanding what tracks horses need to work on. Because ask racehorse trainers, you ask 20 racehorse trainers how tracks should be prepared, you'll get 23 different answers. <laughs> 20. You, that, you know, and so you needed someone who was strong that understood tracks and luckily had a passionate for, passion for tracks. Wherever I used to travel, I was going to say, what tracks, what are they doing there? You know, and, and once you get involved to that extent, I was always trying to help management through my years in the boards and serving as a trainer's representative and how best to keep training tracks because obviously the better the training tracks are the better it's easier to keep the horses sound and that's what our job is as a racial trainer you've got a sound horse you three quarters of the way yes, there yes. and so that's how I got involved Michelle didn't want to lose me to this to the industry and he said please please you've got to take a concert why don't you go and run Summerfeld at the time Ralph Smart was getting nearing retirement age and you know there was always a lot of discontent with with the management, whoever was running the training centres, and even when I took over, you won't believe it, we had to have a meeting in this clubhouse, and Mike Cock ended up, we had some trainers who thought that I might prepare the tracks to suit my way of training. I mean, that's how ridiculous it became. But I must say, it's been a wonderful journey, and I've enjoyed every single minute of being responsible for running Summerfeld. It's been since from 2012, so it's going on 10 years now, because there's so much more to it than just looking off the training tracks. You've got 500 and 600 grooms living in the hostel. There's that challenge. They're not employed by Gold Circle, they're employed by the trainers. I wear both hats, and I've always tried to say to the board members, also, but you know, you have this idea that people are not captured, but they, they have um, a vested interest in, in one side. I've always said I've tried to wear the honest broker's hat. If you love the racing industry, and in which I really love it, it's completely part of my DNA, and I think this, this little chat we've had, you will understand when you've been in something from the age that I have, you wouldn't still be doing this if you didn't you have did, a passion absolutely. for it, and you wanted it to do well. And wherever I am in the industry, I would love to see it do well, because it's such a great industry, and the race is such a most beautiful animal, you know, and there's just so much excitement from the pedigrees and watching them run and compete against each other. It's a thrill that, uh, you know, I'm surprised that a lot of people really clamoring to be involved. But running this facility and, and, and trying to keep it in a pristine condition for trainers and their horses to work on has given me a great thrill and all the other aspects and dealing with the staff and, and I've had a, I must say, the trainers have been very supportive. Um, I don't get a lot of moans from them, you know, I deal with the moans very well. I get a moans about a lot of other things but really not about the training facilities. I um, oversee Ashburton, I have since Bruce Jackson left and CZ's moved on to four racing, 
whether it will remain open as a training center we will see and that decision will be made it'll be a business decision but of course we'd like to keep it open there's maybe other things we can do but these these are all the balls in the air at the moment yes, as we yes. know the, the case with the business rescue practitioner and gold circle will come to a head this year um, it'll be heard in april and hopefully by june we will have a a ruling on it and you know we're reasonably confident that we we will be positive the outcome will be positive for gold circle and and we re re also need to recapitalize this industry a little bit. we need some security in going forward and it's very concerning that the legislature provincial legislature just gazetted changes to the the gaming act in kwazulu natal that could have a a real um detriment effect, detrimental uh, and damaging effect on 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 our revenue stream um in the racing industry and it is definitely not a good time to be looking to we've come out of COVID. we're in an industry that's been in crisis and obviously we're going to interact with them in every way possible we've all written these lengthy letters um, to them and every part of the industry as, as my role as the chairman of the south african trainers association and vice chairman of the kwazulu natal trainers association we've written a letter to them appealing to them I don't think people understand enough about the model, the business model in racing and where the owners fit in and the breeders and the grooms and the trainers and why it's so important to have government supporting this industry because these people will lose, the, the guys, a lot of us will lose jobs in this industry, assistant trainers and it they will ne it'll never be resuscitated mm. in South yeah, Africa yeah. and the trouble is those people will most probably never work in their lives again yeah. because they have a very specialized skill, they weren't fortunate as I said earlier enough to be well enough educated to do anything else and they just like most racehorse trainers they leave school, racing's in their DNA, they either rode work and I mean I rode work as a youngster, you, you, you get hooked in every aspect of it sure. and unfortunately it will be very sad if, if that if that yeah, day that comes. Yeah. But and Tony, you're chairman of the South African Race. Yeah. Uh, South African National Trainers National Association. Trainers Association. I started it about uh, two years ago at the behest of the Jockey Club, interestingly enough, uh, okay. the National Horse Racing Association. I didn't start it because I wanted a naughty bad, any more <laughs> naughty bad. I didn't want any more work because, believe it or not, Andrew, <laughs> I'm, I mean, I've got so much work on my plate, it, it's frightening. Um, but I did it because the late Lyndon, the, the previous CEO of the National Horse Racing Authority, Based on the parliamentary portfolio hearings in Cape Town, where, they, where the industry was, was castigated because we actually didn't have an association that represents all the trainers in the industry. We're talking about grooms issues and racing related matters, and trainers didn't have a national voice. And so at some stage, he begged me to do it. I didn't want to because I knew it's just a lot of hard work. That and Lyndon Burns, yeah. and, and through Lyndon, we formed it, and then through V, you know, V also pushed me along a little bit. And that's why we have a South African National Trainers Association. Yeah. Hard work. It is. Everything's hard work. <laughs> but it's, it's fun anyway. There's yeah. a fun aspect to it. Well, we're going to have to wrap, yeah. Tony. And, and sure, as I said, you know, we've been having a wonderful podcast with Michael Roberts. We could have gone on for five hours. We had a lovely podcast with Dennis Bosch. We could have gone on for five days. And, and now you, and, and just fantastic. But two silly questions, uh, quick questions, uh, for a bit of fun to wrap up the podcast. What is the most whether it's racing or personal, what is the most irritating? Th what is what irritates you the most? What what uh, grinds Tony Ribbon the most? I'll, I'll most probably when you in these public forums you read comments from people that actually have very little idea of what happens behind the scenes, and the criticisms they they. They're, not, they're never going to solve the problems. In fact, they just exacerbate the problems we have because unfortunately for the ordinary guy who doesn't know much about racing and he reads a lot of these negative comments, um, negativity is something that I don't enjoy. I, it, it never does anyone in any business or any sphere of life any good. I know it's hard to always remain positive. There are challenges, but in racing, people sling off very easily without knowing all the facts and that just detracts from the product of horse racing and that is something that I do not enjoy. Okay, good point. And the last thing is Tony Rivlin's alarm goes off in the morning or your, your cell phone alarm or your body clock, what's the first thing you do? First thing I do is look at the phone to see whether the power has been disrupted at Summerfelt <laughs> and the irrigation didn't work overnight <laughs> and the tracks are going to be dry and that I'll tell you okay, before, so you know, I get up quite early but there's a few trainers that work at midnight and I want to see if anyone's posted something on the group, oh, there's a wet patch on the track and I start my morning with a knot in my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, Thank well, you. from us, uh, it's just Andrew, you, 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 would have, you know, know Tony, Tony much longer than I have and yeah. Just wonderful, and thank you for all that you do. No, it's not brown nosing, and no, it's not uh, all these funny things. 
<laughs> because as you say, negativity, we, you know, everyone's quick to criticize and pull everybody down. The quicker we all stop criticizing and try and nurture one another and push each other forward for the whole sport and the whole industry from the CEO down to the ladies and gentlemen that stomp the track, the better. So that's, uh, I've always been banging on that drum, you know that. I oh, know, it's worn out. <laughs> no, well, it's never going to wear. But Tony, thank you. Thanks for everything. And, yes, and we know that you, you're, you're a door that we can knock on at any time. And uh, we appreciate it and we wish you all the very best. Andrew, well, Tony, well done, man. There's no more. Uh, there's no racing in KwaZulu Natal Saturday or Sunday, so we're racing at Hollywood Bets Scottsville on Monday. Will you be there? What a pleasure! I will be there. Lovely. There's no form guides. They've just been printed, so we can't tip you any winners. But it's been a long enough show, and it's been a great show with Tony. We wish him all the very best. We thank him for all that he does for the horse racing industry. And all that's left for us is to wish you well, stay safe, and uh, remember to be nice rather than to be nasty. And as always, like, share, subscribe, do whatever you've got to do on the YouTube channel and on the Facebook page, and send us some comments. Post some memories of, of Tony, you know, of Senor Santa and all those good horses, and uh, share your memories with us. We'd love to hear them as well. From Warren Lentverna, Andrew Harrison, Tony Rivlin, Tawanda Taravinga, and the whole production team, Stay safe, goodbye, and we'll see you as always in the number one box. <laughs> Lovely interview with Tony Riverland. Drop us a comment and tell us what you believe or what you feel the industry, the racing industry needs to improve and to get better. You heard Tony talking about it. So share your comments with us and see what you would like to see changed so that we can bring the game forward and get it better for you.